Hey golf people, it's time for part two of our Ask Me Anything series. This was in celebration of us hitting 40,000 subscribers. So many questions that I had to break this into a couple of videos now. This is installment number two, let's get right into it. Sam Gaines asks, what were your favorite iron sets or golf club sets that were on the less expensive side? Well, if we get into the package sets, I bar none think Styx has the best package set and it's really, really inexpensive. It's even better, I think, quality-wise than the Costco Callaway Edge set, which that would probably be my number one all-time favorite. But these days, that's a very hard set to find just because I don't think, I don't think they're producing them anymore. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe they are. Um, so right now, I'm definitely gonna say sticks uh, in terms of package sets. I'm talking about like golf clubs brands in general. I thought those Tommy Armour 845s um, really good value and really great club. And uh, Wilson staff makes great inexpensive clubs comparatively. I mean, <laughs> nothing's cheap in golf right now, but they're, those two brands especially are making some really uh, attainable clubs that are really good quality. And then an iron set that you're gonna see here on the show that at least me and the simulator taking a few shots here, uh, the, the Tacomo clubs, those things are really nice as a direct-to-consumer brand. So certainly I think there's value to be had out there, uh, but those would be the brands that come to mind right away. Next question kind of talks about what we just talked about, but Brent asks, can you do reviews on smaller direct-to-consumer club companies like Sticks, Birdie, Cali, et cetera? So like I said, Tacoma will be coming very soon. I've, I feel like I've done a number of these direct-to-consumer brands already. We've done Torridge Exotics, which you can find that in some golf shops, but to my mind, that's pretty much direct-to-consumer. Um, Docus. We've had Bomb Tech wedges on this show. We've had a couple of others. So I certainly have nothing against direct-to-consumer brands. I try to showcase the ones I think that are doing innovative things in the golf space here. Crunch Time asks, if I could play any course in the world, what course would I play on? And for me, you know, a lot of people, first things that come to mind, they'd think Pebble Beach, Augusta, Pinehurst, those sorts of things. All, all those clubs, by the way, I have not played, and I would like to play those clubs. But for me, the number one club I'd love to play is Royal County Down. I just love, absolutely love Lynx Golf. To me, at least, it's the epitome of uh, beauty and spectacular dunes and ocean views and that sort of thing. It's in Northern Ireland. I think it's at times been ranked the number one course in the world. And that would be it for me, Royal County Down. Daniel Area says, what are some of the bucket list golf courses you'd love to play? So we mentioned Royal County Down, that's up there. If we stay in Northern Ireland, Royal Port Rush is something I'd like to play. There's a whole slew like Bally Bunyan and things like that on the west and southwest coast of Ireland that I'm hoping again I get to play in September, uh, but those are way up there. I'd love to play Carnoustie in Scotland, Kings Barn. I've, I've been to St. Andrews, but I didn't actually play it. It was 40 degrees and I wasn't in the mood to swing a club at 40 degrees at St. Andrews. But uh, I'd love to get back there in the summertime when <laughs> we get a 75 degree day. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll tackle that. If we get away from the aisles there and we come back to the United States, um, I got to play Whist Whistling Straits, which I absolutely loved it. That was fantastic. So courses in that vein, that genre, I love Lynx courses. Uh, so I guess we'd be talking Chambers Bay, uh, Bandon Dunes, Cabot Cliffs. Those ones would be probably the highest up on my bucket list right now. Joe Medea asks, have I ever had a proper wedge fitting? And if so, where and was it worth it? Um, no, I haven't had a proper wedge fitting technically. Uh, again, I wouldn't be necessarily opposed to it, but kind of like putters, I feel like wedges is something you sort of get used to. I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, Vokey wedges were the ones that I sort of switched to and became comfortable with. And once I became really comfortable with it, I'm just a person of habit, a creature of habit. And so even though the SM9 is now on, I'm still playing my SM8s because to me, there's not a whole lot of difference really uh, from year to year when it comes to Vokies, but I love the weight of them and I, I get the right distance and spin that I really need. And so since I'm used to my Vokies, I don't see myself switching. And that's not to say I won't review wedges on this channel, I certainly will. And I've got some Mizunos I gotta review here. So I'm not necessarily opposed to a wedge fitting, but I am also a creature of habit. So I'll probably stick with my Vokies for the time being here. Uh, but it might be fun to actually go through that process. So anyway, Joe, thanks for the question and we'll see what happens. Mark asked me, how did you decide to be a YouTube content creator? So this is the let's play through origin story for those that don't know it. I started as a golf travel channel. And the reason I started that channel was a couple fold, I guess. 
First of all, I never knew my grandfather, never met the guy. He died before I was born. And one of the reasons I really wanted to do something on YouTube here is to leave a bit of a memory for my kids, their kids, my great grandchildren someday. If they never meet me, they'll at least kind of know what I was like and what my personality was like. So that was definitely one big reason I did it. The more practical reason I did it though was because at the time, that I started this channel, I had a golf marketing business and my business was helping private clubs build their membership. So I was going around to these really exclusive places all over the world. I was speaking at conferences because I had written a book on golf club marketing and I had a podcast called Private Club Radio, which a lot of the general managers in the private club world would listen to this podcast. And because of that, again, I had speaking engagements and, and books and things like that from it. So, to make a long story short, I was visiting all these really spectacular places and then I thought to myself, well, you know, so many people don't even get a chance to walk in these places. Maybe I could show them what it's like and give them a little taste of what it's like to go to some of these places. So between kind of leaving a legacy behind for my family and future generations to at least know what their great, 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 great grandpappy was like, and then giving people a little window into what the private club world was like, that's how uh, the genesis of this show started and it's evolved from there. And ah, man, I, I love the way it's evolved and it's just become such a cool passion project of mine. And thanks to you and all the folks that watch this show, it's become my full-time job. And I absolutely love it. So thank you for asking that question. It's always good to turn back the clock there. TJ Warner asks, just wondering, when did you start making YouTube videos and why did you start making YouTube videos? So I started basically three years ago, almost to the day here. Uh, it was August of 2019, I believe, that I started the channel. So we're sitting here August 2022 as I make this video. What's crazy though is how exponential this platform is. The first year of me doing YouTube really had almost no views and no subscribers for the most part. I think we finally got to a thousand, maybe uh, like, 18 months in possibly, but from like that 18th month to now, it's just been, seems like a rocket ship almost. So uh, I hope we get to 100,000 a lot quicker even than that, because that's that's my ultimate goal. In the next year, that is the goal. You know, if you could help me get there by uh, recommending this channel to a few friends, that would be much appreciated. Um, but uh, yeah, three years ago is when I started. Golf 101 asks, what camera mic setup do you use for on-course vids? I, uh, there's two, basically. For the most part, I use a Sony a7S III. It's a camera I'm using right now as I record this video. It's got, um, you know, interchangeable lenses so I can get really nice shallow depth of field and change that out. It does 4K, it does slow motion, so it really does everything I need. It's not a cheap camera, but for me, it's lightweight enough in this genre of camera. But if I really want lightweight portability, sometimes I'll actually shoot some of these videos just on my iPhone 12, I have an iPhone 12 Pro Max and uh, it's got a fantastic camera built into it and it's got that HDR so you see the clouds and you see the green grass and makes for a really nice image. Uh, but those are my two primary setups. In terms of a microphone, if I'm using the Sony a7S III, this is it. It's got a big windscreen on it. This is called the Deity. And what I like about this mic is it's actually uh, a microphone on the front and the back. So a lot of times you'll see me talking from behind, you know, showing you the course or something. I'll use the back mic and otherwise I'm using the front mic when the camera's facing me and that that cuts down on the wind there. So that's my setup. It's really no frills. Uh, that's what it's got to be because when I'm playing golf, listen, the golf course doesn't shut down for me. Um, I've got a group right behind me many times and I've got to be quick. So I'm kind of in the traffic pattern of the course there on Wednesday mornings or sometimes I play in the late afternoons as well. So it's for me, it's all about speed and it's about reliability and not complicating things. Shooting golf vlogs and golf reviews is complicated enough. I don't need the cameras to get in my way. David George, always a, a, a friend of this channel. I see your comments all the time. Thank you, David. David asks, what is the one piece of technology that we should all be using? I gotta go rangefinder here. I thought this one over. I mean, if you're not playing golf with a rangefinder, I think, you know, you're definitely missing out. I, I dropped two, probably three strokes just by switching to, from eyeballing things to having a rangefinder. And, uh, you know, it's just, Gosh, there, there's so many rangefinders out there right now, there's really no excuse not to get one because you can get one for 80 bucks. You can have a top of the line Bushnell like I've got for 599 uh, and everything in between. So that would be, certainly be it. Uh, some ones I really like, Pro LX Plus from Shotscope, love that one. I've got a review on that one. 
Uh, I really like the Voice Caddy he SL2, which is right on my desk, because uh, it's got this screen uh, and it even gives you green maps and heat maps and things like that. So definitely rangefinder, 100% would be uh, the one piece of technology that I think every golfer should have. The next question here is, with the new pricing of the Bushnell Launch Pro, where would it rank for you for home launch monitors? Um, absolutely, it still would be my number one choice at the price point. I don't think it's really, there's a match out there. The closest optical device, and I do think that, especially for indoor golf simulators, I think optical is the way to go for the most part. Uh, the closest one would be the SkyTrack, and I just find the Bushnell to be a little bit more accurate even than the SkyTrack. And so for me, especially doing golf club reviews, I need the most accurate I can so I can give you the most accurate feedback on these reviews. Um, I wish I could have a GC4. I just don't have the money to buy myself a GC4 to be quite honest with you. So even though it's $1,000 more, you are now getting club data with all of the packages uh, in some ways. I think over time it could actually be a less expensive device if you do the math on silver subscription rather than the gold subscription, which is to me more viable now. I don't wanna get into the weeds. You can watch this video over here if you want. To me, it's still the, the unit of choice. Now there is this Unicore iMini coming out, which I am excited for, poten the potential of at least, although you know we'll see where it's priced and whatnot. For me right now, Bushnell is still the best of the best, at least from what I can afford in that mid-market range. Um, Francis Schaus asks, do light WT drivers and irons really help older golfers just marketing height? Oh, lightweight, <laughs> that's what the WT is. Yeah, I mean, it's gonna help you swing it certainly a little bit faster and that's gonna help you with distance. So I think it can help, but you should always test it for your own self and for your own game. Uh, the simulators don't lie really, so uh, you know, try a number of shafts, try a number of different clubs and see what works for you. John S asks, right thumb placement on the grip for right-hander top of grip versus left side of grip, how it affects ball side spin? Right thumb placement, it's not something I ever think of. When I grip a club, I try to be center. I don't ever think about going right or left, honestly. It's not something I've ever considered um, since I was three years old and learned how to grip a club from my dad. That's just always how I've done it. So I don't know the answer to that question, John. I appreciate, the, appreciate you asking it, but probably that's a better question for a PGA professional rather than me. Luca Brasi, TTV asks, how can I get more consistent on my irons? Um, I feel like it's my swing path. There could be other things I'm not considering. How to get more consistent really is just honestly practice. Um, maybe not trying to hit the ball as far. I did a recent video here on things I wish I knew when I started golf. And one of the first, I think it was the first tip I let off with was just not trying to hit the ball as hard and as far as possible. Consistency sometimes means you gotta take a little bit off the swing. And I'd rather hit my seven iron 155 yards and know exactly where it's going rather than hit it 175 and have no clue personally. So maybe take a little bit off your swing, possibly at least you know, practice and, and see what works for you, but it's just practice, honestly. Frank asks, ultimate question, can I have one of your putters? Well, Frank, we give away clubs on the show all the time. I don't think I have ever given away a putter, have I? I don't think so. Again, I just don't test that many putters and the ones I usually do test are the ones I really like, so likely not, but um, thanks for asking, Frank, it was a good try. Bill Wallenstein asks, tell us more about your vacation and getting out. Do you have family there and they doing okay? Now what Bill's referring to, and some of you may or may not know this, but I got stuck in Ecuador. They had this national protest. I was holed up in a hotel room for a week. I made an entire video about it and I talked it over with my friends and my wife and other people and we just came to the conclusion that it wasn't a right fit for this channel because this is a golf channel. Uh, and that was a much more personal video, although the video does exist. So if you wanna check that video out and the crazy helicopter ride that ensued and everything about that, <laughs> that journey, uh, I've got a video in the community tab. If you scroll down, I should have a link to that video. It's unlisted on the channel, so you won't find it searching. But if you go to the community tab, you can find it there, Bill. Uh, it was pretty crazy. But yeah, my wife is originally from Ecuador. She has, she has a lot of family down there. Um, where they are is a, is a completely different place from where I got stuck because I was out traveling throughout the country. So they are completely fine and they live in very safe neighborhoods. So no problems there, but thank you for the concern, man. And again, if you do want to check out the whole story, community tab is where that video lives. 
Stu Dog asks for, do you root for the Baltimore Ravens or the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Great question, because I'm originally from Baltimore when I moved to Florida to Tampa Bay in 20, let's see, when did I move here? 1994, yeah, it's been a while. Uh, I was 14 years old when I moved here. Um, yeah, I'm first and foremost a Buccaneers fan. Uh, that's my NFC team, 100%. Luckily, I can have an AFC team or two, and I've got the Ravens and the Patriots that fill that need. So if those guys are in the playoffs and my beloved Bucks are not playing them, that's who I'll be rooting for, certainly. Uh, but, you know, I'm a Tampa Bay man all the way. M. Bizzle asks, Forge Tech one lengthy go. I guess he's asking my opinion on those. Like I said before, I think certainly it's worth trying out. It uncomplicates the golf swing by having one swing. You're going to lose some distance in the three, four, five irons, uh, but maybe you're not even playing a three iron anyway, so it wouldn't matter. But in, the, in those higher irons, you're going to lose a little bit of distance, uh, maybe gain a little bit of distance in the, you know, pitching wedge, nine iron, that sort of thing. I certainly think it's worth a shot. Um, I will hopefully have a video about it, you know, one of these days we'll, we'll get a set and see what it's like. Camp Living asks, three wedge versus four wedge debate, how many wedges to carry? It depends on your game. I carry, I don't know, depends on if you consider a pitching wedge a wedge, uh, but I carry again like 50, 54, 58, so I've got three. I've thought about maybe taking that uh, three wood out of my bag or three hybrid out of my bag and replacing that with a um, 62 or something like that, but it's so few and far between I'd have to use that shot and I feel like I could just open my uh, 58 up a little bit. So, I mean, I didn't even realize there was a real debate, but I think it's all a personal choice when it comes to that short game stuff. It's really whatever you feel confident standing over uh, and you can hit the shot. The old adage, golf is 98% between the years is so true. You, got, you have to have confidence and, and feel positive about whatever shot you're gonna attempt. Believe it or not guys, there's still more questions that came in on Instagram as well as on YouTube here. So, woo, we got another video, at least more to do. Stay tuned for that one. I'll catch you back here very soon on another edition of Let's Play Through.